Greetings. Father Mark signing on, continuing the series on the papacy in the early modern period, moving into the reign of Pope 212, Pope Sixtus IV, reign from 1471 to 1484. The uh, death of Pope Paul II, uh, he died of a stroke, uh, was sudden. He had been in good health. It took everyone by surprise, meaning no one was prepared for a conclave in 1471. They ended up choosing a well-known Franciscan preacher and theologian, baptized Francesco della Rivere, that's R-O-V-E-R-E, Born into an impoverished family near Savona, Italy, that's northwestern Italy, uh, on the way to Genoa. Born on July 21st, 1414. His family gave him to the Order of Friars Minor, the Franciscans, when he was a child. And through them, he was educated at Padua and Bologna. He served in virtually every position in the Franciscan Order up to and including being elected Master General of the Order on May 19, 1464. This brought him into contact with the Curia, uh, the Pope's governing council, senior cabinet, so to speak, uh, because he had, to, he had to deal with them as general to look after the Order's interest. His personal lifestyle remained uh, simple, in keeping with his Franciscan training. He pursued the work of the order conscientiously. His writings and preaching were clear, well presented. Uh, he had no uh, clouds hanging over his past or deleterious family alliances from previous pontificates. And so on August 9th, 1471, he accepted election as Pope 212 his baptismal name, Francesco, he could have been Pope Francis. Uh, but there was not a Pope Francis until the current one. Uh, so instead he took the name Sixtus. He was the fourth pope to take that name. He reigned for 13 years and three days. <clears throat> Though he continued to live a, a disciplined personal life, Pope Sixtus did succumb to the Renaissance temptation of nepotism. Uh, justifying it because his family uh, was genuinely impoverished. Among the relatives he promoted to high position in the church were six <laughs> of his nephews. Uh, one of them, Giuliano della Rovere, was uh, named a cardinal in 1471 at the age of 18. And he would later become Pope 216, Pope Julius II, and he's the one who commissioned Michelangelo to commit uh, to uh, paint the Sistine ceiling, and uh, he commit. And Julius is the one who tore down Constantine's St. Peter's to build the current uh, St. Peter's Basilica. But we'll get to him later in the modern history series. For his part, in 1471, Sixtus commissioned the renovation of the Church of San Pietro in Vincerli in Rome, that's St. Peter in Chains. Uh, it's the uh, church that has the, uh, under the altar, uh, you, you, but the altar is such that you can see underneath, they have the chains that were used uh, on St. Peter in the Mamertine prison before his execution. Uh, work continued on this renovation for years and when the Pope's nephew became Julius II, he, uh, he put Michelangelo's statue of Moses in this church, and it, it's still there. In uh, 1476, on December 8th, Pope Sixtus approved a special mass and office in honor, office in the, in the divine office, the liturgy of the hours, in honor of the Immaculate Conception of Mary. The proclamation of this as a dogma occurred officially on December 8, 1854, by Pope Pius IX, 
in the encyclical Ineffabilis Deus. Yet the action of Sixtus centuries earlier, 1476, reveals to us that the truth of Mary's Immaculate Conception had been known and celebrated liturgically. It was, and it was done even centuries before him, as early as the 7th century in the East, and in the West as early as the 9th century. A dispute arose in the period of high medieval scholasticism between the Dominicans and Franciscans about the nature of of the Immaculate Conception. The Dominicans argued that if she had no sin, like if, she, if she did not have original sin, then she was not redeemed, which would make no sense because she would then be the only human you know, not redeemed by Christ. Franciscans, though, beginning with uh, the Franciscan scholar Duns Scotus, argued that Mary was preserved from original sin by an anticipated grace which was possible because God is not limited by chronological time as we are. As a Franciscan, Pope Sixtus naturally adhered to the latter position and used his position as Pope to insert this into the liturgical calendar. The Council of Trent dealt with this in Session 5, June 17, 1546. Uh, the salient sentence reads as follows. This Holy Council declares, however, that it is not its intention to include in this decree, which deals with original sin, the Blessed and Immaculate Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, but that the constitutions of Pope Sixtus IV of happy memory are to be observed under the penalties contained in those constitutions, which it, the Council, renews. And uh, you can refresh your memory on the teaching itself, Catechism Numbers 490 through 493 on the Immaculate Conception. In 1476, back to England, a man named William Caxton, that's C-A-X-T-O-N, lived from 1415 to 1492. In 1476, he opened the first English language printing press in England. He opened it in Westminster, which is part of the, uh, which is London, basically. Caxton was a merchant and traveled, you know, and, and part of his travel brought him to Belgium in 1450. And there he stayed and he learned the trade of printing, brought it back to England. His first printed English language work was Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, which we alluded to earlier. Chaucer was uh, patronized by John of Gaunt, the first Duke of Lancaster. Over the course of his life, William Caxton printed 108 English titles, 26 of which he himself translated from another language into English, either Latin or French, because he, he was fluent in both. In 1477, Pope Sixtus dedicated a church built by a Florentine architect and engineer named Baccio Pontelli, P-O-N-T-E-L-L-I. The church was Santa Maria del Popolo on the north side of the Piazza del Popolo in Rome, where the ancient Via Flaminia turned north to Rimini. The church uh, is distinguished by a hexagonal dome decorated with a mosaic of creation uh, uh, designed by Raphael of Urbino, whom we covered previously. He was an apprentice to Perugino who had apprenticed to Verrocchio. The same, you know, we covered that in a previous uh, video. The next year, on Sunday, April 26th, 1478, in the city of Florence, a, um, a, a, a rivalry between two houses, two families, uh, culminated in homicide and sacrilege because uh, the homicide uh, took place in a church during Mass. This is the infamous Pazzi conspiracy, P-A-Z-Z-I. That was one of the families involved. The rivalry was between House Patsy and House de Medici. 
So at Mass on that day, in the Duomo, in the cathedral, uh, Giuliano de' Medici, who was the brother of the more famous Lorenzo de' Medici, was stabbed 19 times and died of his wounds. He was stabbed by Bernardo Bondi and Francesco de Pazzi. They tried to kill Lorenzo also, and he was wounded, but he survived. This was um, a plot to remove the Medici from their place of ascendancy uh, in, in the city of Florence and to try to replace, you know, make House Patsy the, the ascendant family controlling Florence. Uh, among the conspirators was Jacopo de Pazzi. He was, uh, mur- he was executed by defenestration. He was thrown out of a window. Then to finish him off, the mob dragged him naked through the streets and threw his remains in the Arno River. The Patsy family was stripped of all its possessions in Florence. Every vestige of its name was effaced. A uh, relative by marriage, different last name, but he was related, Francesco Salviati, was Archbishop of Pisa. He was also involved in the conspiracy. The Medici captured him and uh, hanged him, executed him by hanging, along with Bernardo uh, uh, Bondi and Francesco de Pazzi. They, they were hanged from the walls of the Palazzo Vecchio, which is where the, uh, the Signoria met, the, uh, the city council. <clears throat> uh, Lorenzo uh, did manage to save the nephew of uh, Pope Sixtus IV, Cardinal Raffaele Riario, uh, who, who was involved in the conspiracy but may not have realized you know, the fullness of it. He may not have realized that homicide was involved. Uh, Lorenzo also spared two other relatives of the conspirators. Uh, but the Patsy were, were destroyed as a, as a, uh, as a family of, of name. The hangings from the Palazzo Vecchio were witnessed and sketched by Leonardo da Vinci. Lorenzo raised his murdered brother's son, Giulio, uh, and that Giulio, which is why I'm mentioning all of this, that Giulio later became Pope 217, Pope Leo X in 1513, and it was during his pontificate that the Protestant movement began. In 1479, Pope Sixtus dedicated a newly constructed bridge, the Ponte Sisto, named for for him, you know, Sixtus Sisto. It uh, replaced uh, a previous bridge that was removed. It was crumbling and unsafe, the Pons Aurelius. It was a bridge across the Tiber River connecting uh, Campo di Fioro, uh, on the Vatican side of the river, with Trastevere on the on the ancient side of the river. This bridge is important because it was the first bridge constructed from scratch, meaning that they tore down a previous bridge and built a new one, constructed from scratch in the Renaissance style, meaning a bridge decorated as a work of art and not simply a piece of functional engineering. It was done by the same Florentine architect and engineer, uh, Baccio Pantelli, who had done Santa Maria del Popolo. On November 1st, 1478, Pope Sixtus IV, at the request of King Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabel of Castile, whom we've already met, created an ecclesiastical tribunal for Spain which came to be conventionally referred to as the Spanish Inquisition. Okay, so much, this is, you know, uh, much has been said and written about this, uh, often misrepresented. So, uh, to clarify, first by defining terms. The term Inquisition comes from a Latin verb, inquirere, which simply means to search. The general term, inquisition, can be, can be and ha- has been used to describe a number of distinct canonical realities in the church. 
First, the Roman Inquisition. Subsequently renamed the Holy Office, and subsequently the Holy Office was renamed the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which it is still today. On June 28, 1988, Pope, uh, later canonized, so St. John Paul II, issued an apostolic constitution, Pastor Bonus, uh, about the the Curia, the Roman Curia. Um, Articles 48 through 55 define the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, meaning defines the Roman Inquisition. Some of the articles reflect later developments, but portions of it reflect the enduring function of the Roman Inquisition from the beginning. For example, Article 48. The proper function of the Roman Inquisition is to promote and safeguard the doctrine of the faith and morals and the whole Catholic world. So its competence in things that touch this matter in any way. So anything that pertains to faith and morals. So that, I mean, that's pretty broad. Article 51, to safeguard the truth of faith and the integrity of morals, the Roman Inquisition um, has particular care to, to take cognizance of and address errors about faith and morals that have been spread in any way. Because if an error is spread and taught then, then even a well-intentioned person might think that they're believing and doing what's right just because they were erroneous, they're, you know, they, they, were, they were taught something erroneous. Article 52, the Roman Inquisition examines offenses against faith and morals, um, whether in behavior, the celebration of the sacraments, or public teaching, which have been reported to it, and if need be, uh, proceeds to declare and impose canonical punishments that that are appropriate. All right, so that's the Roman Inquisition, the high. The second type of Inquisition, or second ecclesiastical reality to which the term Inquisition has been and legitimately can be applied, are diocesan tribunals. That is an ordinary ecclesiastical court which handles canonical processes within the jurisdiction of that bishop of the diocese. Ranging from sacraments, today it's most often marriage, you know, uh, annulments. Uh, but it could also serve as a, as a fir- court of first instance in dealing with uh, charges or accusations, somebody accused of schism, heresy, apostasy, uh, or even a serious moral uh, offenses. Third, distinct canonical reality to which the term Inquisition can or ha- has been legitimately applied returns us to the year 1233, the reign of Pope 178, Gregory the Ninth, reigned from 1227 to 1241. In 1233, he created the French Inquisition, which was, from his perspective, a new ecclesiastical court that was distinct from the previous two structures, distinct from the Roman Inquisition or from diocesan tribunals. In that, it was a tribunal given authority to function on a national level, so not limited to a diocese like a bishop's tribunal would be, uh, with particular care for coping with an emergency situation. In his case, it was the Manichaean Revival the revival of the Manichaean heresy, which manifested in France as Albigensianism. And we covered this earlier. It's on the medieval playlist. The French Inquisition on, the, on that national level was entrusted to the Dominicans because St. Dominic, although he was already a priest before he founded the order, he became involved in France only because of the, even though he was Spanish, uh, but because of this Albigensian heresy. So the Dominicans, in a sense, were founded for that reason. Uh, it was, at first, a purely ecclesiastical forum where an accused was questioned, hence Inquisition, a search, search for the truth, about suspected beliefs. And a sentence 
of either orthodoxy or heresy was pronounced. Ideally, uh, I mean, so if a person was accused of heresy, he or she could go before the, the Inquisition and clear his name. Or, if heresy was pronounced, then ideally the accused would recant the heresy once it was explained. If they refused to recant, then the penalties at first were only spiritual. Suspension from the sacraments, a period of penance, or excommunication. That changed when the Albigensians became violent and when it became a civil war in France. In the medieval mind, you remember there's no separation of church and state. That, 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 that's, that, that idea developed much later. In the medieval mind, where every monarch w was a Catholic monarch, the legitimacy of a sovereign was sealed through the right, through the ritual of coronation. Coronation was a religious ritual, it took place in church, modeled on the Old Testament anointing of the kings of Israel. So heresy against the church necessarily meant treason against the secular ruler because the legitimacy of the sovereign was, had its foundation in the anointing by the church. Now, all societies reserve the most severe penalties for treason. So when the tribunal of a church in the context of a civil war in France pronounced a person heretical, and they refused to recant, then the government, then they were turned over to the secular arm, as, what it, as was said, then the government treated them as traitors, including torture and execution. Some priest who traveled with the French armies during the Albigensian War expressed alarm at, at, what, at you know, the way this was, at the direction this was taking in particular at the torturing of prisoners in order to obtain confessions. And they reported this up the, up the chain. And, and so that led to a later pope, Pope 180, Pope Innocent IV. <coughs> he reigned from 1243 to 1254. He clarified the situation on the proper use of the Inquisition on May 15, 1252 in a apostolic constitution, well, a papal bull, it was a call at the time, ad extra panda. Okay. Um, it allowed the use of torture on those captured in the Albigensian War because their very participation in the war was evidence that they were, in fact, guilty of treason, you know, against the monarch and, and heresy, and the Albigensian heresy. So the purpose of the torture to obtain a confession was to elicit a confession of guilt so that they could repent. Only those who did not confess in that context were executed because by the act of war, they were guilty of treason against the state because this is a civil war. Now, subsequently, this document was taken out of context and, and used to assert that the popes approved of the use of torture. Now, that this, of course, is disturbing to modern ears, but the essential contextualization is the first, torture was a recognized part of the judicial process in both church and state in the medieval period, meaning torture's obtained... Uh, conf uh, Confessions obtained under torture were admissible as evidence. Now, I'm not saying that's right or, you know, that that should be, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, but it was, I mean, the church, both church, the state, I mean, it, you know, in secular, if someone was accused of being a thief and they were tortured and they admitted it under torture, then that would be evidence against them. So it wasn't just the church. It's not to defend, I mean, it's just to place it in context. Uh and, and the second, the particular context for the French Inquisition was a, a civil war. Okay, so that with that background, we now come back to the Spanish Inquisition, created by Pope Sixtus IV on November 1st, 1478, was the second national-level Inquisition, a tribunal given authority to function on a national level 
with particular care for coping with an emergency situation. In France, it was the Albigensian heresy and civil war. In this case, in Spain, it was ascertaining. It, the, the trigger was, the, it was ascertaining if conversions to Catholicism were genuine. So I remember Ferdinand and Isabel want to unite the whole Iberian Peninsula as Catholic. And there were many Jews and Muslims, you know, who, who and so they, in order to remain in Spain, they had to be Catholic or they had to leave. So there were many Jews and Muslims who were converting to Catholicism. And, you know, some would be accused, oh, well, you, your conversion is not sincere. You're just doing it so you can stay. So that was the original, the original request of Ferdinand and Isabel was to have trained theologians to investigate such charges. Um, because they wanted a completely Catholic country. If, um, if they remained, if, if they converted, and, you know, if they remained, then Jews who converted were called conversos. And Muslims who converted were called moriscos in the Spanish context. As it turned out, 200,000 Jews left Spain. 50,000 converted and remained. Of the Muslims, um, uh, there were a total of uh, estimated uh, 498,000 Muslims. In, uh, in in Spain and uh, in the Emirate of Granada, of those sixty three thousand converted and uh, lived under the authority of the Kingdom of Aragon, another seventy thousand converted and lived under the uh, authority of the Kingdom of Castile, and the rest left. The monarchs were concerned by the possibility that these conversions might not be authentic. And, and therefore, you know, a person who would lie about such a thing, to their way of thinking, was capable of anything, including betraying an army or a city during a battle. So the king and queen wanted churchmen to ascertain this for them, and Pope Sixtus obliged. Since torture was a, a component of the judicial system of the day, it also appeared in the Spanish Inquisition. Not because the church thought it was a good idea, but that's just the way the judicial process was done then. In 1483, after only five years of existence, the the same thing happened as happened in France. There were just there were priests on the ground who who were very concerned about you know that because the, the 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 scope the legitimizing of torture uh, that attracts certain personality types. I mean, normal sane people would uh, are you know are, are repelled by that, you know, just by the thought of, and certainly the act of, of torturing another human being. But there are other personality types uh, who are deranged and who derive pleasure from that. And, and so naturally this, this, was, this was abused. And, and there were many ghoulish things occurred. And there was, there was some priest who witnessed this. And so they reported it up through the chain and uh, and that led five years later, in 1483, to Pope Sixtus intervening and creating clear procedures to put in place. First, from from his reform, no anonymous accusations were to be accepted. So if someone just wrote a note, you know, and and slipped it under the door of somebody who worked for the Inquisition and said, oh, that guy over there, you know, converted from Judaism, and I know it's fake because I've seen him, you know, do whatever, pray from the Torah in Hebrew. But now if it's anonymous, that would just be thrown away. It would not, not be accepted or investigated at all. Second, a person could only be brought before the Inquisition after three witnesses signed a statement of accusation. Third, if that if the, that happened, someone was brought before the Inquisition, an advocate would automatically be appointed 
meaning a canon lawyer, would automatically appointed, be appointed to represent them. <coughs> Fourth, the accused was first asked, they're brought in, they've given an, an advocate, and then they said, okay, you, you, well, you've been accused. And since this is a church court, you can guess that it has something to do with theology. Before we proceed, you now, you can write down the names of all of your enemies, anyone you think hates you enough or for whatever reason might falsely accuse you of anything. So they're given time to do that. And then the, 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 that list that the accused wrote would be reviewed. If even one of the three accusers was on that list, the accusation was thrown out and the whole process would end. Fifth, execution was only inflicted on a person who had been found guilty a second time after confessing their heresy, repenting, publicly recanting, but then being found guilty a second time after going th even with all these safeguards in place. Now, there's no way to know everything that happened behind every locked door in every dungeon. But since these were judicial processes, records were kept. And those records indicate that 15,000 people were accused before the Spanish Inquisition and repented and were reconciled to the church in an auto de fe, a public act of faith. 2,000 were executed by incineration as irreconcilable heretics meaning after recanting a first offense, being accused again, going through the process with all those protections and being convicted a second time. Now, there were many others who were accused and cleared. For example, St. Ignatius Loyola was once brought before the Inquisition because while he was still a layman, as he was accused of impersonating a priest and offering sacramental absolution in the context of giving his spiritual exercises. So he was called before, he was investigated. People who went to him said, yes, we talk about spiritual things, but he never, he never pronounced the words of absolution. He never wore the purple stole. He never claimed that it was, you know, that he could absolve us of sins. And he was cleared. St. Teresa of Avila also was brought before the Inquisition. She was accused of witchcraft for the extraordinarily vivid experiences she described coming to her in contemplative prayer. And that's one of the, you know, she was her advocate, uh, told, okay, write up your, your spirit, write it all up. And so that's led to her autobiography. As she also was cleared. You know, so both of those are two, just two examples. People who were brought before the Inquisition were cleared and then went on to, to great influence in church history and to become saints. Now, all that said, prudence in the light of fallen human nature you know, might dictate that the near occasion of sin provided by public acceptance of torture means that it should never be used. Just the possibility that it should never be. And I'd certainly, you know, I think modern sensibilities would agree. But in making any evaluation of this, keep in mind the time, the place, and the circumstances. Uh, and, and that torture, you know, as repugnant as it is to us, it was accepted as part of the legal process of the day. And if someone accused you of stealing, you would be tortured to get a confession. You know. <clears throat> okay. All right, back to England. <clears throat> um, we last visited, uh, we mentioned Edward IV, the uh, first crown king of York, of the York dynasty, uh, fell ill in the spring of 1483. His oldest son was only 12, second son only 9. So he appointed, Edward IV appointed his brother, Richard the Duke of Gloucester, as Lord Protector to be fiduciary of the realm, you know, until his oldest son uh, could take over. Edward IV then died on April 9, 1483. Uh, so technically at that point, the son, also named Edward, was Edward V the second crowned king of York. However, he disappeared. 
and his younger brother, Richard of Shrewsbury, disappeared. So these are the princes in the tower, you know. Uh, you can even Google that, and you'll find all kinds of endless, endless theories about it. Um, so technically, Edward V became the second crown king of, of the York dynasty sec to rule England when his father died. Uh, however, prior, prior to his official coron coronation, his uncle, Richard of Gloucester, had the marriage of Edward V's parents declared invalid. On the grounds of Lagaman, seminarians, if you, if you had your canon law of marriage yet, uh, Lagaman means that a, a person is not free to marry because of a prior bond. And the person, you know, that, that a, a prior bond to a person who is still alive and in a ceremony that has not been canonically reviewed, so is presumed to be valid. Uh, therefore, uh, that Edward IV was not free to marry the mother of the two princes, Elizabeth Woodville, because he had already secretly married someone else. Now, th th this is caused just as an excuse for a coup d'etat. So Richard of Gloucester took uh, the princes, Edward V and Richard uh, of Shrewsbury, into protective custody. So put him in the Tower of London in August of 1483, just to make sure they're safe, and they were never seen again. Uh, presumably, they were murdered. Their younger sister, Elizabeth, survived, and she's the one who ended up becoming Henry VIII's mother. However, since no bodies were ever publicly buried, many pretenders to the throne of England plagued English history over the following generations, presenting themselves as being one or the other of these boys or the offspring of those boys. Meanwhile, Uncle Richard had himself crowned Richard III, uh, the third crowned York King of England and the last. He uh, was crowned on July 26th, 1483. <clears throat> uh, same year, following month, August 15th, 1483, Pope Sixtus IV celebrated the first Mass in the newly renovated Papal Chapel, the Capella Maggiore, the Chapel of the Papal Household, subsequently named in his honor because he, you know, he, he had it renovated. So Pope Sixtus Sistine Chapel. But officially it's the Capella Maggiore, the larger chapel of the Papal Household. It was on the site of the older one, and officially, it's, it's dedicated to Our Lady. Sixtus had it renovated by his favorite architect, uh, whom we've already met, uh, Baccio Pontelli, the guy who did the bridge and did Santa Maria del Popolo. In terms of architecture, the Sistine is, is fairly straightforward. It's a rectangle, 134 feet long, 44 feet wide, 68 feet high. He had it decorated not the ceiling, the, the, uh, the walls, decorated with frescoes uh, by some of Verrocchio's pupils who were now either journeymen or maestros themselves, Perugino, Botticelli, and Ghirlandaio. Uh, those original Sistine frescoes depicted the life of Moses on one side and the life of Christ on the other, so the Old Testament and the New. Later, uh, when the nephew of Sixtus IV became Pope Julius II, he had a few additions made to the Sistine by Michelangelo uh, to the ceiling. And of course, that, you know, is, is one of the central works of Western artistic history. We'll get to that uh, later. Pope Sixtus IV died on August 12th, 1484. He was followed as Pope 213 by Pope Innocent VIII. And it is to his reign that we will turn next. So for now, thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned.